This is the February 3, 2023 Market Plus segment for Market to Market. Joining us now, Sean O'Leary. Sean, how'd that first segment go? Are you, are you, I'm surprised you're still here. I think I, you did pretty well, Paul. Because well, <laughs> my words are on the screen, yours are not. Right. right. Uh, we did a podcast a couple of months yeah. ago, had a chance for some of your background. From Carroll, Iowa, your father was in commodities. You didn't study commodities in college. You, did you want this job? I was actually kind of a studio guy, broadcasting and film major, perfectly then to a commodities career. Parallel. Just kidding. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, born and raised in Carroll, Iowa, uh, attended the University of Iowa, graduated in 89 with a communication studies degree. Uh, was looking for a job and dad said, well, where do you want to work? What do you want to do? Told him, I'd just like to work for a good sized company. I never really understood what he did, but you know, a few years of college might have brightened me up a little bit. He told me about it and I became very interested in it. Been doing it ever since. And now here you are uh, on the show getting asked questions. Yeah, you might not have wheat in your backyard, but you have customers that pay attention to it. So thank you for putting up with my 15 wheat questions. <laughs> no that's just my, that's just the way I show love and affection. How about that? Appreciate that. All right, well, let's start with, uh, it's a question with wheat in it. So that's where <laughs> I'm going. Uh, Mark in Minnesota, Sean wants to know, with future prices for wheat, soybeans, and corn being range bound, what is your forecast for basis levels of these commodities for the first half of 2023? Well, I think that's going to continue to be uh, quite variable and uh, from region to region. I mean, you can, you can say that any time of year, probably any given year with all of those. But it's, uh, it's, it's been the case where there have been some real big differences in basis levels. and. Uh, I, I think even though the markets are range bound, you're, you're going to continue to see that play out and it comes down to uh, areas that were a little bit short on the crop some long last fall. And uh, I think you'll see that into the spring and probably early summer. And I would imagine the areas that are, like you said, a shorter crop, but maybe areas that need the end product more for a livestock, say North Dakota down to Texas their basis could really fluctuate wildly here. Yeah, yeah, I would agree, I okay. would agree. And it's a, it's, a, it's a function of how, uh, how aggressive the end user wants to be, and they're, they're gonna start turning to our own weather domestically as soon as South America's weather talk is done. Well, yeah, I, I'm out of weak questions, but I wanna get you into politics, how about that? Uh, Paul in North Dakota wants to know, Sean, uh, if we go to war with China in 2025, who will buy our corn, soybeans, and pork? Boy, uh, very good question. I don't know that there's any answer that is anything other than not very pretty. Um, you know, China, it, it, it's great to have a big customer like China, uh, unless you lose that big customer. And uh, unfortunately, they're kind of the tail that wags the dog in, in uh, both the uh, uh, the corn and bean markets to to a large extent. There's a reason that, that they put uh, money into infrastructure over many many years in South of South America. So uh, our uh, political climate with them right now is probably uh, the worst it's been in several years. You know, there's there's tension between uh, what how we've approached bases in the Philippines and Guam, for example. They're not real happy with that. Uh, I don't know where all, all of our product would be uh, exported to, if not to China. It w and that's been a discussion several people have had here of, you know, China's buying ahead of a 2025 invasion. But can't you say over the last now three years since COVID started, I mean, the world dynamic can change so can the markets and who's buying and who's selling. And we've seen China really not be as aggressive of a buyer in the last, what would you say, three, six months? Yeah, I, I, would, I would say that's the case. Uh, you know, we, we have a tight, tight balance sheet on a lot of, lot of markets, corn and beans included. Uh, China is usually, uh, I think, pretty shrewd as a buyer. Uh, they have at times bought only what they've needed. They have at times bought ahead. 
uh, it's, it's kind of hard to put a finger on uh, what they're gonna do. Right. Uh, they're, they're, they're good at kind of keeping their cards close to the vest. And as Don Rose likes to say, they're the ones who taught everybody how to trade, so mm -hmm. you know, we look to them for examples. <laughs> right, okay, right. Uh, here's one, uh, Ken in Michigan, and I think you like this question uh, when I read it to you before. Many of your market analysts recommend using options as a hedging tool. Do they consider position delta when making that recommendation? Using delta is, is probably the easiest uh, of all the Greeks you can have an understanding of. Uh, every option, a put or a call, long or short, has a delta value. Uh, the delta value is going to tell you uh, roughly, as a percentage, what the option is going to do relative to a move up or down on the board price. So a, a put that has a delta value of 0.6 means that if corn goes down a dime, your uh, put option, if you own it, is going to increase by roughly six cents. The delta value is going to fluctuate from day to day. It's going to change as the market goes up and as the market goes down. Uh, the delta value is also going to give you an idea of the percentage chance of the option finishing with value at expiration. So if you buy a put or a call that has a delta value of 0.3, I buy one with a delta value of 0.6, I've got better odds of having value at expiration. Difference is I might pay twice as much as you to have that. But uh, I, I think it's, it's an important one to know. Uh, most, uh, most quote services or trading platforms, our own included, is gonna list that delta value. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a good tool. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's something I wouldn't ignore. And if you're going to learn anything about Greeks, that's step number one. Start at, start at the base. Start, start, start right. with Delta. Okay, well, let's start with Ryan and Iowa when it comes to natural gas. Why are NH3 prices so high? When it hit 1600 a ton, natural gas was up to 26. Now natural gas is 250, and NH3 is still pushing 1200. Sorry, NH3, I read faster than I meant to be. Yeah. What's the explanation? You know, I, I can only imagine it's kind of like crude oil. Crude oil moves down. We don't see it at the pump for quite some time. I, I can only imagine the natural gas situation is the same way. And uh, unfortunately, it's probably the case where uh, the producers of it, if they can charge a higher price for a long enough time, they'll get by with it as long as they can. Well, natural gas this week, for the, for the record, was off. 16 percent yeah so you're saying it might be a little while before we see that reflection but this isn't the first time we've we've declined so i guess i'll take this a step further sure. and tie in one of the other questions would you be buying any inputs right now or do i think that do you think that there is a price break coming in some of these fertilizers and other inputs i i think i would I would dip my toe in the water on, on, on covering needs for that. Uh, if you look at the nearby contracts of natural gas, the, the futures contracts have lost a lot of value. They, they have really gone down a, a lot. Uh, there's a chance that, that those recover and the cash price never really matches what the board price does. So I, I, would, I would start covering costs here, yeah. You, okay. you may not get much more of a chance to later. All right, thank you. Um, so another opportunity that could be lost is old crop. Tim in Iowa wants to know, should a person keep on stringing out old crop sales of corn or is it time to finish selling the old crop? Some of the people in the chair before you have said, open up that bin door and start selling. Okay. Um, I think... I think it, it varies from producer to producer depending on how much of your old crop you have left. If you are uh, undersold at this point relative to years where you had been more aggressive on sales, I think I'd, I'd you know, start, start to be a little bit more aggressive. I had mentioned the uh, planning intentions report. You could save a little bit for that uh, if you're, uh, you know, if some of your sales were made at more attractive prices, 
you know, going back to, uh, you know, we're, we're a, a fair amount off. If you had made some sales early on, uh, maybe you can afford to be a little bit more aggressive and, and hold for that report, hold for maybe, maybe a weather scare into planning or even the month of, of June. Right, you did talk a little bit about that weather during the, the main show about, yeah, uh, I, I, I won't say they're fun bushels, but you're more of your, if I lose, I lose, but man, if I hit it big, that'd be great. Bushels. Right, right. Okay, all right. right. Uh, I guess I didn't fully give you the full haze on everything. I didn't ask about the cotton market. Uh, cotton's okay. been kind of stuck in a sideways range for quite some time. Uh, talked to a couple cotton people here recently. They just don't see much interest in planting any of that. Do you see cotton buying acres, or is, is this an acre story right now, or is this a China story right now? I, I think it's a combination of the two. Um, I looked at that earlier this week. I was curious as to, uh, you know, when you talk about cotton acres, you also have to talk about soybean acres. Um, cotton, at, at the start of the Ukraine war, uh, had a 20% 20, 20 price increase Beans only went up seven and a half percent, and I'm talking about the highs made in in July, and uh, I think I think cotton actually peaked in June. Beans in in July, cotton then bottomed out in October. Beans bottomed out a lot quicker, but the from the contract high, uh, the cotton declined 45 percent and is still 15% lower. The beans, after a 7.5% rally, right now is still sitting at a 5.5% gain. That's a big swing between those two price-wise. The, the bean contract, notional value, a uh, lot bigger contract than the cotton contract. But I would say uh, the, the way cotton looks, you, you might think, well, if it's seen that much of a decline relative to the bean price, is, is that a buying opportunity? Mm. I, I don't know that it is, honestly. If, if I were to approach it that way, I'd probably go back to the options and maybe some, some short option premium. The cotton option market isn't nearly as liquid as the bean option market is. But there might be, and I, I, I uh, do, did a Google search for a cotton soybean spread. Yeah. Couldn't find anything. Oh, <laughs> well, you're gonna have to write it then when you're done here. Might be a crazy idea, but might be some opportunity there. All right. Thank you so much, Sean. Appreciate it. Thank you uh, for your time. I appreciate it as well. All right. Thank you Sean very much. Sean O'Leary, everybody. That's it for Market Plus next week. We are going to look at a startup that's gaining momentum in preserving pollen. And Matthew Bennett will be in to offer his analysis on the markets. Thank you so much for joining us, and have a great week.